Hey guys, Tyler here. Metroid is a franchise that, on the surface, has been overlooked by Nintendo for quite some time. The last chronological release came out in 2002, which might as well be centuries ago. But with the surprise announcement of the upcoming release of Metroid Dread in October, I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to examine a few of the major alien species featured in Metroid, starting with the Metroids themselves. On the surface, Metroids share a lot of similarities with the Xenomorphs from Ridley Scott's Alien. Both are parasitic predators that undergo forms of metamorphosis during their life cycle and feed off the energy of other beings. They also organized themselves into hierarchies with queens at the top, and they were discovered by humans on a planet with an alphanumeric codename. Obviously, some major inspiration was taken from the Alien franchise, but despite sharing many similarities, there are quite a few attributes that make Metroids unique in their own right. Today, with the help of friend and fellow YouTuber Phobia, I'll explore their physiology and how parasitic aliens such as Metroids could evolve on a planet in real life. First things first, Metroids are actually not naturally occurring creatures. They are a product of genetic engineering and biological science. Not evolved, but designed. We learned from Fusion that when the bird-like Chozo species first colonized the planet SR388, they quickly learned that the apex predator of the planet, the X-Parasite, was capable of infecting not only their own species, but every known form of life at that time. The X had no natural weaknesses or vulnerabilities, and exposure to one always resulted in the eventual death of the host. Should its species ever become spacefaring, it would mean the end of all complex life in the galaxy. The Chozo came to the realization that the only way to counter the threat of the X was to specifically design a new type of life form to be immune to X infection, and with the explicit purpose of being predatory. Fighting fire with fire, they created a perfect predator to defeat a perfect predator. But they underestimated the threat of their own creation. Once released onto SR388, Metroids began preying upon everything, X parasites and Chozo included evolving and adapting until they had inhabited every biome of the planet. Which, of course, set the stage for Samus' arrival to the planet in Metroid 2. The Metroid life cycle is particularly fascinating in my view. As I mentioned earlier, it's a form of metamorphosis, with the Metroids going through several distinct biological stages with different appearances as they approach adulthood. We see metamorphosis in several types of animals on Earth, including in frogs, jellyfish, and of course, insects. Frogs come from tadpoles, jellyfish from phytoplankton, you get it. But did you know that there is more than one type of metamorphosis? In insects, the simplest type is called a hemimetabolous transformation, or incomplete metamorphosis. This is the type in which insects like cicadas, grasshoppers, crickets, dragonflies, mayflies, and others will shed their exoskeletons in a process called molting. Generally, adults will do this once and only once, going through three distinct life stages, egg, nymph, and adult, or imago. Unlike the larvae of other species, insects that have a nymph stage already resemble their adult forms before they fully matured, except that they lack certain appendages, like wings. There is no pupa stage, which brings us to the other form of insect metamorphosis. Insects that undergo a more elaborate, complete transformation during their lives, with multiple stages that appear very differently from each other, are referred to as holometabolous. This group includes ants, beetles, flies, mosquitoes, wasps, and other insects that begin their lives in a worm-like larval form and eventually grow up to resemble other insects with fully developed legs and wings. But the most prominent, perhaps, of the holometabolous insects are moths and butterflies. Most of us learn in elementary school that after hatching from an egg, the butterfly starts off as a caterpillar. This is their larval form. They then enter the pupa stage, which in butterflies and other species is a cocoon, often made of silk and, in some cases, their own poop. After they mature inside the cocoon, the newly formed adult must escape either by cutting its way out or secreting enzymes. The reason that so many species undergo metamorphosis, scientists believe, is that it is a form of hormonal control. Different life stages of various animals express hormonally influenced traits at particular times in their life cycle. 
It's an evolutionary characteristic that dates back millions of years and is likely fundamental to most life, with certain kinds of organisms, particularly reptiles and mammals, having evolved out of metamorphosing, exhibiting ametaboly. But enough about Earth life, what about the life cycle of Metroids? Well, to put it bluntly, it's much more elaborate than anything found in real life. Metroids start out, like many depictions of aliens, as an egg. This is stage one. Stage two is the hatchling, or the docile infant Metroid that emerges from the egg to imprint on its mother, as seen in the end of Metroid 2. This stage is short-lived, but apparently very influential on the Metroid's psyche, as it will remain loyal to the mother it imprints on for its entire life. Three is the jellyfish-like larva Metroid that is capable of hunting, and is the form encountered most often in the Metroid series. During the larval phase, Metroids can split and multiply very quickly through a process known as binary fission, which is indicative of another aspect of their biology that is perhaps the most glaring. Larva Metroids are unicellular. Their body is composed of a single, self-contained unit with a translucent membrane surrounding a nucleus, and this very well may be the reason why the X cannot infiltrate their bodies. Side note, this artificial form of reproduction, engineered by the space pirates in Metroid 1, can actually be characterized in more detail regarding its similarity to normal cell division on Earth. Given that Metroids are unicellular, lacking many of the complex organelles that characterize complex animal cells like mitochondria, it's tempting to compare them to prokaryotic life forms that predate the evolution of eukaryotes on Earth. Prokaryotes, which include bacteria and archaea, like extremophiles and plankton, actually lack an enclosed nuclear membrane. But in eukaryotes, including plants and animals, the process of mitosis is distinct in that it involves the creation of a spindle apparatus to separate copies of chromosomes. Binary fission, on the other hand, is significantly less complex. Thus, the Metroid larvae, possessing an enclosed nucleus, cannot be directly grouped under any Earth-based categories. It is distinctly alien. As for what makes Metroids themselves so dangerous, in addition to their high resiliency, they are themselves parasitic, meaning they can feed on just about anything. While different evolutionary stages are capable of different types of attacks, the most common and iconic form of Metroid behavior is their latching onto prey with fangs and draining the victim of energy. The games refer to what the Metroid species feeds on as life force, so if you're wondering what exactly the Metroids are sucking out, be it blood, bone marrow, brain fluid, etc., I would say the answer to your question is all of the above. Believe it or not, this is not entirely outside the realm of possibility. There are numerous examples in nature of animals that, well, steal blood and other fluids from other animals to gain sustenance. For example, three currently known species of vampire bats' main source of food is blood, usually from birds. An organism's primary source of food being other animals' blood is called hematophagy. An informal name for this practice is vampirism, which of course is a big inspiration for the naming of vampire bat species. But hematophagy is also common in many worms and arthropods, including insects like the mosquito. May they all burn in hell. Some fish, like the lamprey, a notably jawless fish with suction cup-like teeth, and some species of bird, like vampire finches, practice hematophagy. Having evolved independently many times throughout Earth's history, drinking blood has clearly been demonstrated to be successful for a lot of predators, as grim as it is. So if Metroids are essentially space vampires, you may be wondering how exactly they're less of a threat than the X-Parasites were. Well, Metroids are very hardy under the conditions of their home planet, yes, but like a vampire's weakness to silver, the Metroids have a vulnerability of their own. Since SR388 has no natural frozen biomes, the Chozo designed the Metroids to be susceptible to freezing in sub-zero temperatures, a weakness the X themselves do not have. This was done as a failsafe to make Metroids vulnerable to Chozo weaponry, or more specifically, their ice beam. This is the reason that Samus alone is sent to SR388 to exterminate the Metroids, her power suit being the Galactic Federation's only access to Chozo technology, and by extension, the Ice Beam. After the larval stage is the fourth stage, the pupa, or alpha metroid. Alpha metroids are distinct from the larva in that they more resemble an arthropod, though their legs are not fully developed, and thus they lack ground locomotion. In the fifth stage, or gamma metroid, these pupa are more fully developed and can walk on the ground while retaining their ability to fly. 
another major transformation in the sixth stage. The Zeta Metroid emerges, this time resembling a quadrupedal theropod dinosaur. They lose their ability to fly, but have the highest amount of agility of any stage in the life cycle. Finally, the seventh and most powerful form of a standard Metroid is the Omega Metroid, which, along with the Zeta stage, form the adult phase of the life cycle. Omega Metroids are bipedal, sacrificing the mobility of the Zeta stage for increased strength and size and gaining new attacks. Other strains of Metroids exist as well, although they are much less common. Their weakness to cold makes them easy to manipulate in a laboratory environment, and this combined with their natural predatory behavior makes the species of interest as bioweapons to both space pirates and the human galactic federation alike. This experimentation gave rise to unnatural breeds like the radioactive Phazon Metroid from the Prime series, for example, which have traits and capabilities that can vary wildly. Point being, the Metroid species was designed from the very beginning to kill, and they're very good at it. As far as reproduction, the only Metroids that can reproduce naturally by laying eggs are queens, which grow from Metroids that have certain special genes activated. It's unknown if the queens, which are quadrupedal and the greatest in size and strength, follow the exact same life cycle before becoming mature enough to reproduce. Normally, then, most other Metroid forms are infertile, and unlike an ant or bee colony where members congregate in a central complex surrounding the queen, infant Metroids usually leave their birthplace to grow independently. Clearly, Metroids are one of the most interesting alien life forms in both sci-fi and gaming. Their life cycle is far more complex than one might initially presume, with distinct forms that exhibit wildly different biological characteristics, some of which are analogous to Earth animals, some of which are not. They are unicellular, but not quite prokaryotic or eukaryotic, and while they utilize DNA structures that we'd find familiar given all of the possible combinations of amino acids in the universe, obviously the end result is something that is more unexpected and makes for a formidable enemy during gameplay. But what about the other alien species in the Metroid universe? Perhaps by examining their creators, the Chozo, more closely, we can uncover some more interesting information about the Metroids and how the two species' relationship sets the stage for what we witness in the games. More on that another time. Thank you all so much for watching. I'm interested to hear your thoughts in the comments. Big thanks to Phobia for helping out with the script and narration for this video. You can check out his channel in the description below. He makes excellent videos about glitches you can perform in various video games, including Super Metroid. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my channel even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description below. That's all I have for this week. I'll see you in the next video.